Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Greg, and um, thank you, everyone, for joining in today. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the work that we ran down here at Gatton a few years ago on phosphorus nutrition in growing steers. Um, it was part of a, a larger project which was funded by Meat and Livestock Australia and we ran that with uh, Tim up in the NT and his colleagues up there. Um, before I start, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge some of my colleagues that were involved in the work down here, uh, Dennis Poppy and Pete Isherwood from UQ, uh, John Milton from University of Western Australia and uh, Matt Callaghan from uh, Ridley. Uh, so stepping back a little bit, phosphorus is uh, a central nutrient for um, growing animals as it is for breeders as well. Uh, most of the phosphorus is stored in the, the, the skeleton, um, so it has a really important role in skeletal growth and skeletal strength. Um, but it's of interest to us is it's it's got a really important role in, in animal metabolism and um, phosphorus is required for uh, the storage and um, metabolism of energy in the cells and DNA synthesis and um, and in lipids as well. So it's really important nutrient. Um, and so the the response of um, growing cattle to to pea supplements is is really variable and depends on a, a whole range of things. Um, and, and as Tim mentioned, much of Northern Australia is based on soils that are uh, deficient in phosphorus. Yeah, um, so in general, uh, the lower the pea content in the soil, looking at the figure on the left there, uh, the lower the, um, the supply of phosphorus from the pasture. Um, and as that soil pea increases, then the amount of uh, phosphorus in the pasture will increase up to a certain extent as well. That's just a general picture. Um, and so the lower the supply of phosphorus from the pasture, the more likely we're going to get a, a response to supplementation. So looking at the figure on the right there, uh, this is all uh, historical data. Um, the the um, You can see that the, the, the magnitude of the response for the supplemented steers, the red line, um, is much higher when uh, the soil uh, pea content is is low, and as the soil pea content increases, that the response to supplementation decreases. So, in in addition to the severity of the phosphorus deficiency, um, the other the other issue uh, that will determine the likely response to a pea supplement is um, the the quantity of um, pasture available um, and the quality. So obviously if there's, there's insufficient pasture available then you're not going to get a response to a phosphorus supplement. Um, and then secondly, um, uh, as Tim alluded to in his talk, um, a response to pea is, is more likely to occur in growing animals when protein and energy uh, are not limiting in the diet. And this is typically in the wet season, which is also when there's more feed available. So there's a greater capacity for those animals to eat more of the pasture and hence gain more weight. And so in the dry season, if the protein and energy of the pasture don't meet the requirements of animal for growth, uh, then uh, you're unlikely to see a response to a pea supplement. Um, and, and this is nicely demonstrated by some of the historical data that uh, Winter and uh, David Coates and others um, pulled together in the in the 80s. Um, they can clearly see that the the greatest difference in um, uh, cumulative weight gain of um, steers at Catherine was at the end of the um, end of the wet season, um, and then. Those, those gains diminished uh, as the dry season um, occurred and there was no, no benefit from continuing um, pea supplementation um, through the dry season. And so this, this leads to the basic recommendation for wet season supplementation of growing cattle. 
Um, it doesn't mean that pea's not deficient in the dry season, it's just that the, the, the first limiting nutrients are protein and energy and they need to be addressed first. Um, I guess one example of an ex uh, exception to this might be cattle grazing a legume-based pasture on pea deficient soils in the dry season and, and they may sell a response to a, a pea supplement um, in the dry season because there's sufficient protein and energy there. And so the other, the other issues around the variability of the response of cattle to pea are obviously variability in pea intake and this is just animal to animal variation. Um, and then of course the, the physiological state of the animal. Um, so young growing cattle, lactating cattle have higher demands and are more likely to respond to a pea supplement. Um, and also, the, the reserves that the animals hold in the skeleton themselves and the ability of them to mobilise those um, to meet some of these basic metabolic functions of phosphorus. So moving on to our, our experiment, um, you know, there's, there's a plenty of excellent work done and um, some really good publications available already to help, to help guide in industry with um, supplementation recommendations and decision making by producers around the growing animal. Um, many of those recommendations for growing steers um, from 30 years ago are still valid today, I think. Um, so moving on to our experiment, why it was undertaken, and Tim also mentioned this, that for whatever reason, it's believed that uptake of pea supplementation is not quite as high as it might be. Um, so our experiment really set out um, to demonstrate again the likely response of growing cattle to a, a pea supplement. Um, we, we're trying to look at some of the recommended indicators, so diagnostic indicators of a likely response of a growing steer to pea supplements. And also we were revisiting the uh, current recommendations on um, phosphorus requirements for growing animals from the, the feeding standards and seeing how they aligned with uh, the results that we got in our experiment. So our experiment, we ran it down here in Gatton. We ha had steers come down from uh, Swans Lagoon uh, in the trial, so that gives you an idea of how long ago we did this work. Um, and uh, the the experiment involved uh, 30 steers in individual pens. They're all about 220 kilograms live weight at the start of the experiment. Uh, the experiment had two phases. The first phase we called a depletion phase uh, and during this phase all the steers were fed a, a diet that was formulated to replicate the wet season, so about 10% protein, 60% digestibility and to that base diet we added uh, biofos to give us five different levels of phosphorus in the diet and the steers received uh, six steers um, received each of those treatments um, and that period went for about six months and then we had a repletion phase where all steers were fed the same diet which was still high in protein and high in digestibility um, but at that highest level of um, uh, dietary pea content and at the end of that three months repletion phase uh, all those steers were slaughtered and we um, we got some uh, carcass data back, MSA graded data back on those. So looking at the um, depletion phase initially, um, initially it took approximately six, five to six weeks for those steers uh, to start to demonstrate a divergence in live weight in response to the uh, pea content of the diet. Um, from, from that point on, from around that circled um, area that you can see there, um, the, the, the steers that were fed the lowest level of pea in the diet, um, they gained about 0.2 kilograms a day. And you can see over the last sort of 60 days, they actually started to lose weight. Um, whereas the steers that were fed the highest level of phosphorus, they, they pretty much gained about 0.9 kilograms a day over the entire, uh, experimental period. And so over over 170 days uh, in this trial, that was about 130 kilograms live weight difference between our highest and lowest um, 
uh, levels of phosphorus in the diet there. So just to give you an idea of what these steers looked like at the end of that depletion phase, these two steers were the same weight at the start and uh, the steer on the left is obviously the one that was uh, exposed to a low phosphorus diet for six months and uh, his colleague there on the right, uh, uh, you know, about 130, 150 kilograms heavier uh, over, over six months. So entering the repletion phase, uh, what we found was that um, the the intake of those steers that were formerly on a uh, uh, previously on a low P diet, uh, it increased immediately. Within days, uh, you could see the the intake increase. It was really incredible how quickly that changed, um, and and they they. Uh, demonstrated some compensatory gain during this period where the weight gains were in the order of 1.2 to 1.4 kilograms a day over that uh, three month period. Um, and while uh, they never caught up to the steers that had a high P diet in the first phase, um, they would have given more time. You know, the reason they didn't fully compensate was just the duration of that compensator. Period. It was only three and six months. I'm sure they would have caught up uh, in terms of um, weight gain. But yeah, I guess the the key thing here is about how quickly animals will respond to a pea supplement when it's provided when the diet has uh, sufficient protein and energy available to not be restricting growth. And that just shows the the, the same two years uh, at the end of that repletion phase just prior to slaughter. So you can see the, the uh, low piece steers recovered a fair bit of condition, but he's never caught up to his, uh, his uh, high P counterpart there. So what, what, what we were really trying to do was develop these relationships between phosphorus intake and live weight gain. Um, and there's plenty of different ways we could have presented this, but um, we've taken a fairly practical approach here, which is purely um, phosphorus intake, uh, grams per day, it's kind of relevant to industry. Um, and so we've got a pretty good relationship there where we can uh, demonstrate uh, the expected live weight gain for this type of cattle uh, per gram of phosphorus intake within the range with which we tested it in the experiment. Um, I guess a couple of important things is that this is P intake, that's total P intake, that's total diet intake. So it's not supplementary P intake. And that these responses are when the diet was above 10% protein and the digestibility above 60%. So typical of the wet season. So we are also interested in how these, uh, this data aligns with the current uh, feeding standards and their recommendations. So on the figure on the right, I've plotted out um, the current recommendations on requirements for a 300 kilogram steer to achieve different levels of live weight gain. Uh, that's the dotted red line with the stars. Um, and you can see it at high levels of intake, so up around that 15 to 20 grams of pea per day, um, there's pretty good uh, agreement between the current recommendations and our data, but at lower um, phosphorus intakes, there's actually a, a, a bit of a disagreement between what the feeding standards recommend and what we've found. Uh, the feeding standards that tend to overestimate uh, the amount of P required at low live weight gain, and I'm, I suspect, and Rob will talk a little bit about this, I think, in a couple of weeks. Um, but this might be attributed to the feeding standards maybe underestimating the amount of pea that's mobilised from the skeleton of deficient cattle. Uh, but really that, that low end doesn't matter too much because we're interested in high live weight gain, right? And so up at those high levels, the feeding standards are, are probably pretty good um, based on our data anyway, so that was good. So what's driving all this? Well, the key driver is... Um, you know, the key driver of this change in live weight is intake. So you can see in the figure here on the left that um, low phosphorus intake um, 
corresponds with a low dry matter intake or a low energy intake. Um, so in our, in our experiment, the steers were all fed ad lib. We didn't restrict anything, but um, they consumed 40 to 50 percent less dry matter and steers that were fed the high phosphorus diet. Um, and this was purely due to the phosphorus content of the diet. And then once that started to happen, the whole deficiency became exasperated because not only were they consuming a low P diet, they were then consuming a lower quantity of it. So the total amount of phosphorus going into the animal was just declining uh, week by week during that experiment. So I guess at a practical level when thinking about these things, uh, it's just important to consider that if you are implementing a phosphorus supplementation program that intakes are going to be higher, growth rates are going to be higher. Tim's already demonstrated reduced mortality and higher reproduction rates. So um, stocking rates might need to be adjusted accordingly um, to account for these higher intakes that we're likely to see. Uh, so this is a little bit messy, but one of the things we were on about was looking at um, some of these diagnostic tests. Um, and I've just put up the blood P here. We've used plasma inorganic P. Uh, looking at the figure on the left, we can see how quickly it responded to a change in phosphorus content of the diet and phosphorus intake, therefore. Um, and in our, our experiment, once they stabilised on their phosphorus treatments, we found that um, the plasma phosphorus uh, concentration remained fairly stable compared to some of the other indicators we looked at. Um, and so it was, um, in, our, in our experiment, it was quite a good indicator. Um, we can see the relationship on the right there between phosphorus intake and um, the concentration of um, uh, phosphorus in the plasma. So it was pretty good. A few different issues around that, of course. It's not easy to take a blood sample. Um, and, you know, uh, some minor differences around where you collect it and the, the state of the animals. Um, certainly uh, coupling it with a, a fecal sample um, to estimate uh, diet quality is important. Uh, so on its own, a plasma inorganic you know, pea uh, is is not as useful as if you can couple it with the the, um, the diet quality to give us an indicator of what the potential growth rate of an animal might be on those diets. And I haven't got it in this slide. I, I had it in one that I, I was tinkering with just before we started. But um, we can then use that um, PIP um, value and plot that against live weight gain. And that's quite informative to tell us what the likely response um, to supplementation might be um, based on a PIP value. Um, yeah, so wrapping up, the take home messages, I guess, from our experiment were um, you know, the largest responses to P supplements are um, likely when, there's, when phosphorus is the primary limiting nutrient, um, and that the response is due to an increase in feed intake rather than any effects on digestion or microbial population or anything like that. Um, I guess the other interesting thing from our perspective was um, if the steers are deficient, they will respond very quickly to a pea supplement um, at the start of the wet season when diet quality um, changes, providing there's enough feed for them to eat and that if the steers are adequate going into a uh, P deficient scenario during the wet season, if those steers have adequate P reserves, then you've probably got five to six weeks before you'll start to see a negative effect on live weight uh, production. Thank you. That's me.